morning. Uh, this morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. Oh, thank you. I was going to do that while well, you were looking for the scripture. Okay. Um, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, on page number 846 in the Bibles on your chairs. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. So what ought to be uh, abundantly clear to you by now as we go through the book of Mark is that, uh, that, that discipleship following Jesus is intensely practical, right? I mean, by that I mean it's mundane, it's every day, it's, it's, it's divorce and remarriage, it's raising children, and today it's money. Uh, its possessions is what do we do uh, with what we have and and so uh, I, I want you to again as we dive into this we're going to see uh, Jesus get really uh, really practical with us and help us understand uh, what's going on in this man's heart and then what the the application is to us so just kind of give you a broad outline of where we're going I want you to see that verses 17 to 22 are kind of the illustration this is Jesus illustrating a point with this man and then verses uh, 23 uh, to 20. Uh, to 27 is what we'll call the application, where, where we get to kind of hear, this is the lesson for you, and then the implication of that comes in the final verses where Peter asks or, or gives his statement uh, about uh, leaving everything. So that's kind of the outline, that's where we're going, we've got to dive right in because we've got a lot to do, this is a, this is, there's so much going on here, and a lot of puzzling things that Jesus says, but I think you'll find this uh, uh, really fascinating and very applicable to your life. So, first of all is the illustration, and, and basically the question that's being asked in this section is what must I do to be saved? So let's look at it together. Verse 17, and he was setting out on his journey. As he was setting out, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now everything's great. When you see this, this seems like you know, it starts off on a good foot. That is, that he's setting out, this man runs up to him. This is not a dignified thing to do, by the way, to run in, in this culture. So he runs, and then he kneels down in a very worshipful, reverent position before Jesus, and then he opens his mouth, and that's when it all falls apart. And look what he says. He says, um, good teacher, uh, what must I do to be saved? Now, I think... This man is very sincere. I don't think he's mocking Jesus. I don't think he's out there to test Jesus. In fact, I would say this. I think most religious people are sincere. And if you haven't heard me say this before, you need to understand religion is not the same thing as Christianity. They are completely different universes. They live on completely different planets. 
Uh, he's sincere, and I don't think that's necessarily the problem with religion. Religion is very sincere. Sincerity is not the problem. You can be totally sincere and sincerely wrong, right? And so this man comes, and do you notice something off about what he says? You ought to see a couple of things there. First of all, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is the first time, by the way, in the book of Mark where the question has been put so bluntly to Christ. Um, so in some ways, we can thank this man for saying what he said. But in that day, in their time, this was not an uncommon question to ask. In fact, if you were a good, devout Jew, you knew the answer to this question because the rabbis discussed it all the time. And here is basically what they said. To inherit eternal life, here's all you got to do. Keep all of God's commandments and avoid sin. Keep them all. Now that, that may sound like, that's crazy. How can you possibly do that? But it was a totally accepted answer in Jesus' day. Listen to what two uh, New Testament scholars, they did some work on Judaism in Jesus' day. Listen to what they, they say uh, about this. It says, that a person possessed the ability, without exception, to fulfill God's commandments was so firmly rooted in rabbinic teaching, that is of the rabbis, that in all seriousness, no joking, they weren't, this wasn't tongue-in-cheek, they spoke of people who had kept the entire Torah, that is Genesis to Deuteronomy, from A to Z. It's possible. And so the way you obtained eternal life in this system, according to the rabbis, was through perfect obedience to the law. And it's obvious that's what this man thinks. He comes, and he, he comes along the same line and says, what? What must I do? That's very interesting. He presupposes that behavior is the ultimate requirement for religion. And he's right. For religion, that is the ultimate requirement. You do things and then God loves you. That's religion. Not God loves you, he changes you and that's why you do things. Radically different, right? So, he knows the answer. I think it's probably safe to say he knows what's going on in the rabbinic tradition. So why does he come to Jesus? Why does he come and asking this question? Because I think deep down, he goes, I'm doing it all, and there's still this friction, and I don't know what's wrong with me, and I'm trying to do everything I know, but something's off. I don't have something. I'm apparently not doing something. Jesus, help me. I mean, you see me, he just falls at his knees. Help me. I, uh, I, I, was, I, I had the privilege of talking to this woman this week who was saved, who became a follower of Jesus through our preschool ministry. Okay, now, I don't know if many of you know, uh, Foothill Church has a school, Foothill Christian School, and we have a preschool, Foothill Christian Preschool, and I've told people that if you can't stay home with your kids, the next best thing to raising your children at home, send them to our preschool. These ladies are amazing. So, so she says, uh, this is how I became a Christian. So I said, tell me the story. She said, you know what? I was, I, I was very devout religious. I grew up in that environment. Um, and and, and I, I would go to all the services. And in fact, I even uh, did all the right religious exercise. I read the Bible in front of the church, even though I had no idea what I was reading. I was moral, she told me. I was a good person. I was a good wife. I was a good mommy. And, and yet, she said, there was something missing. Something was wrong. And I knew it. She said, Chris, it wasn't an issue of I was an atheist and didn't even believe in Jesus. She said, I did. I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believed all that. But she said, I, there was something wrong. She said, so I go, I go to drop my child off at Foothill Christian Preschool one day, and I drop her off and bless their teacher's heart. She sees this woman, and she says to her, she says, something's wrong with you. And she just begins to unload. Like, I don't know what's wrong. I'm trying. I'm going through all these motions. I'm doing it all. I thought this is what I was supposed to do. And this lady, our, our teacher, begins to explain to her, wait a second. Yeah, you believe all the right things. You just don't know Jesus. You don't, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Do you understand that what Christianity is, is you can have this dynamic, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And she prays with her, and, this, and God saves this woman. I mean, she saves her, and she's just radically transformed. She goes, Chris, it's unbelievable the difference that Jesus has made in my life, my family's life. See, I think that's what's going on in Mark 10. He's wrapped up in doing. What do I have to do? The key is some other religious behavior, Jesus, that I have not yet mastered. And if you'll tell me, I want to do this. And, and don't miss the irony, by the way, because look what he says. Notice, good teacher, and I'll get to the good teacher part in a second, but what must I do to inherit? Now, where do we hear words like inherit? That's the language of a will, right? What do you do to inherit? <laughs> you just don't do anything, right? And if you do, you probably should go to jail. Like, You've killed the person that you had, I mean, you, you can't do that. You, you don't do to inherit. You inherit and you simply receive it. That's amazing. This guy says this. What do I, what do I have to do to get the very thing that I shouldn't have to do anything for? And he wants eternal life. So, so I think this man knows intellectually all the right things right I, you're going to see this in a minute but he's missing something he comes to Jesus and now watch what Jesus does good teacher what must I do to be saved now listen to Jesus let me see if I can kind of even put it in my voice inflection so you can hear what he's saying why do you call me good because no one's good except God now, here's what Jesus isn't doing. Because that's a puzzling verse, right? You're like, whoa, I thought Jesus was good. Is he saying, I'm not good? Now, he's saying, why? Why'd you just do that? Now, here's what you need to know about that day. Um, the only one recognized as characteristically good, they didn't talk about good people. He's a good man. That's a good rabbi. He's a good pastor. Goodness was in the Jewish tradition almost exclusively reserved for God. You didn't call, rabbis would rarely let somebody call them good because they didn't want to blaspheme God. So Jesus is essentially going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you hear what you're saying? If you're calling me good, and I am, then you're calling me God, and I am. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if that's really true. I'm going to see if I really am your God here. And I'm going to push on you. You're right. I am good. And you're right. I am God. But let's see if you really worship me. Okay, so, so then he continues in verse 19. You know the commandments. You know all the doing commandments, right? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now, there's a couple things I want you to see in this. First of all, anybody who knows the Ten Commandments looks at that and goes, hmm, I've never heard the do not defraud one. What's Jesus doing there? Okay, most likely what he's doing is this man's wealthy. And one of the ways that, one of the things the prophets always railed against was getting wealth by defrauding. Now, why do you defraud per somebody? Well, it all boils down to, to commandment number 10. You covet, you don't have, you want. So this is Jesus in some ways giving application to this rich man, don't defraud. Okay, so, so he, he does that. He says, all right, and, and, and look what happens. He says, he, he then says, you know, gives him these other ones. What are these other uh, commandments? Essentially, these are in a little bit different order. These are commandments 5 through 10 or 6 through 10. I think that's right. Yeah, 5 through 10. In any event, they're all the ethical commandments. In other words, you got to do or not do, and it's perfect. I mean, okay, let's talk about your doing young man. Let's talk about your doing. You know you don't do these things. And, and the man goes, okay, well, then I'm good. Because I've done all those. I mean, he says, and I've done them since my youth. Probably what he's referring to, you've all heard the term bar mitzvah. 
Bar mitzvah is, is literally translated means son of the commandments. When you're 13 years old in a Jewish community, you, you are bar mitzvahed, and that is that you become a son of the commandment. And what's then incumbent upon you from that time is you are now liable to obey all of the commands of Scripture. So this man saying, Jesus, since junior high, I've been doing this. I have been keeping the commandments, and I've been doing them perfectly. And so look at how Jesus responds in verse uh, 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So here, okay, the question is, what do I have to do to be saved? Jesus' answer is this, doing won't get you there. You must follow me exclusively. Now let's unpack that. Because I love, this story is told in Mark, or in Matthew, this story is told in, in Luke, and it's told here, but nowhere else is this little commentary put in. And that is, that says Jesus looked at him and loved him. Okay, let's talk about those two words. First of all, looking. That word for look there is not just I glanced over, you know, and my mom's here this morning. I look over at my mom. Okay, I just sort of saw her. No, no, no. This is a looking of intense scrutiny. Not a negative, not a I'm, I'm, I'm coming after you, I'm angry, because obviously he's not, he loves him. He looks, and you could say it this way, he looks into this man. He looks into his soul. He looks and he sees everything that's there. there. This man is bared before Jesus. And what's amazing is that Mark tells us that in spite of that, he loved him. And this word, I mean, listen, I love this, first of all, because look at, Jesus sees right through the man. Jesus sees right through you. It, 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 here's what religion does. Religion says, I, I got to throw up this guard and I got to be good enough so that when God looks down, what he sees is all my religious activity. And, oh, I love you for that. But the Bible, what Christianity says, no, he looks at Pastor Chris, and he sees the junk in my heart, and he sees my thought life, and he, he sees the sin that just riddles me, and he looks inside of me and you, and he says, I love you, still. And this word for love, I mean, I, he knows all these secret places. I don't hide anything from it, and in spite of all that, in spite of all my hiding behind religious things, he still says, I love you. And he, he doesn't just say love. I, you know, kind of, I mean, we've ruined the word love. Because I can, I can tell you I love my wife. And I can tell you I love pizza. <laughs> That's weird. Right? That's a completely ruined word. Okay, so what love are we talking about? It says that he, and some of you will recognize the word, he he looks into this man and he agapao, agape him. It's the love that characterizes God's love and it's the love that should characterize our love toward God. And what's amazing about this is that Mark, now I'm not saying Jesus didn't, but Mark doesn't tell us Jesus felt this way about anyone else. That's amazing to me. I'm not saying Jesus didn't love or he doesn't love you this way. Mark doesn't record it. But here's the thing about love, and here's where it's so screwed up in our culture. I, I can talk about love as just some sort of emotional connection. I mean, I could just be like, you know, I just feel warm today towards you. And do nothing about it. And you will never, ever, 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 ever in Scripture see God love someone and do nothing about it. Always. 
Every time there's action, there's I'm going to reach in deeper, I'm going to do something. It's this love of rescuing, of seeking out, of helping, of serving. It's all these things. It's this active thing. And that's what he does with this man. It's like he loves him so much. He looks at him and he says, it's like a father who's forced to do surgery on his son and he has to take the knife and plunge it in to show the son there's cancer in there and i got to help you see this. And so he... He looks into this man, loves him. Does he love what he sees? Oh, I just love, you're just so good on the inside. No, he looks at him and he says, based on my appraisal, Jesus now issues the most sweeping command he's given up to this point. He has never given a command like this. He has never placed this upon any follower or even his disciples. He looks at the man and look what he says. You go, you sell, you give, you come, you follow. Give it all away. Now let me say a couple of things about this. (laughs) Because I think there's a ditch on either side of the road for us that we have to be careful that we avoid. There's some people who are going to read this passage and conclude in their zeal That God wants everybody to be a monk, right? He wants everybody to be poor, everybody to give away all their possessions and, you know, go out as missionaries. So everybody at Foothill Church today, the, the assignment for you is to go get rid of it all. By next week, we need to all, you know, be in Africa. That that's one extreme. That's a ditch that we can fall into. But let me just say something. I don't think that's very likely in America. Now, here's what I mean. Not very likely we're going to get in that ditch. The other ditch is where we're most likely going to end up. We're going to read this and go, well, that's extreme. He can't be serious. So it's not that everyone has to. Actually, no one has to. So you'll, you know, somebody will come up to you and they'll say, I... I feel like God spoke to me today during Pastor Chris's sermon. Or I feel like God really challenged me. God's telling me I'm supposed to be on the mission field. I'm supposed to get rid of everything and go and follow him. What would you say to a person like that? I'm supposed to sell my house, take my kids out of school. We're moving over to Africa. You might hear things like, that sounds irresponsible. That sounds extreme. I think you're being kind of a fundamentalist nut job (laughs) instead of like wow God you really feel like this see so these are two extremes because here's what I think and both are false because here's what I think God will call some of us to give up everything and follow him he will God will call others of you to earn an income. Okay, he's going to say, on the one hand, I want you to, I want you to follow me and, and, and I'm going to do things through you to expand my kingdom. And on the other hand, he's going to say, no, 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 I want you to stay where you are, earn a good income, and I want you to give your money away to expand my kingdom. What you're never going to see in Scripture, and I mean never, is a third hybrid disciple that gets to sit in the middle and go, I get to do whatever the heck I want to with my stuff, and I don't have to do anything to help build the kingdom. And that is 90% of American Christianity. I can sit here I don't have to use my house. I don't have to use my car. It's all mine. It's my money. It's my stuff. Don't you dare. And Jesus has no right. That you'll not find anywhere in Scripture, and that isn't discipleship. So what's Jesus saying? He's going, all right, buddy, here's what I want to show you. You come to me and you call me good. You're calling me God. You fall at my feet. I'm telling you, here's what I know about you by looking inside. You have put your faith and trust in something else. He's saying, look, you've been good. 
Like, right? Jesus never disagrees with him. The guy says, he says, don't murder, don't, don't, don't commit adultery, don't steal. And the guy goes, I did this. And Jesus doesn't go, are you kidding? He, he essentially agrees with the guy. He says, you've been great about commandment 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You forgot the first one. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. And he looks at this man and he says, you've got another God in there. And I'm showing you what it is right now. Tim Keller puts it this way, talking about this man. He, he, this is, he says, this is essentially what Jesus is saying. Jesus looks at the man and says, right now, God is your boss. But God isn't your savior. And here's how you can see it. I want you to imagine life without money. I want you to imagine all of it gone. No inheritance, no inventory, no servants, no mansions. All of that is gone. All you have is me. Can you live like that? Can the man live like this? Look at, look at verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You could translate this, by the way. Disheartened by the saying, he went away, this is interesting, grieving. Grieving. Now, here's why I think that's important. Because remember, in Matthew, Matthew tells the story that Jesus used the exact same word, that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it said he was grieving to the point of death. Now, why do you grieve? You don't grieve because you're about to die. Now, you might be horrified. You might be frightened and scared to death. But grief is not the right emotion. You grieve because of losing something. You see this? You're going to, and Jesus looks and goes, I'm about to die, and yes, I'm horrified, but what, what's killing me right now is what I'm about to experience, and the grief that I'm feeling is I'm going to lose the core of my identity. What's his identity? I have lived in, since eternity past in unbroken fellowship with the community of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all together, and I'm going to go to the cross, and God's going to turn his back on me. And I'm going to lose that relationship. His spiritual center is going to be taken away. His identity gone. So when Jesus looks at this man and says, sell everything, give to the poor, follow me, and then the man grieves, what are we hearing? What causes you grief? When something comes along and takes away your identity, when something comes along and removes your spiritual center, this is the center of this man's identity, and Jesus knows it. Your identity isn't God. Your identity isn't this good, divine God-man standing in front of you. Your identity is stuff. And in his mind, this man goes, if I lose my stuff, I lose myself. By the way, don't, don't mistake. Don't mistake sorrow for repentance. Repentance will always turn you around and you'll run to Jesus. Sorrow will turn you away from God. If that's all that it ever does, See, what Jesus is saying is, man, do you, do you want eternal life? <laughs> if you want to be saved, Jesus says, then you want me as your Savior. I'm the good one. You want me as your Savior, and I won't be a co-Savior with anyone or anything. Not happening. 
You have to replace what is in there. Your functional God, your functional Savior that you bow down to, that you think you can't live without, that your identity is wrapped up in, and you've got to forsake that and follow me. Following Jesus, hear me, Foothill, isn't an, a both and. It's an either or proposition. That's how jealous Jesus is for his, his love for you and your love for him. See, it'd be like this. I go home today and tonight somebody knocks on the door, 7 o'clock tonight, nice guy, you know, the Hollister, Abercrombie and Fitch smell n- n- nails me in the head when he opens the door and he's standing there, he's looking pretty awesome and he's like, hey, I'm here to pick up Michelle, your wife. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, we're, we're going on a date tonight. And be like, chick, chick. no you're not, right? <laughs> She's my wife. What the heck are you talking about? Oh yeah, I thought we could share. What? That's bizarre. What sharing her with anybody? And she's not sharing me. It is exclusive. This isn't narrow-minded. The other is just weird and perverse. And God looks at you and says, I won't have it. I'm not sharing you with some other thing. You're mine or you're not. See, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't think Jesus is looking at this guy and say, here's the ultimatum, you do this or else. You know what I think he's doing? I think he's taking these dangling treasure out, from under, out in front of him and saying, look, I want to show you, I want to give you something far beyond anything you ever dreamed of. Jesus is not saying, he doesn't say to you, he doesn't say to me, you shouldn't care about treasure. I don't think that's the command here. He's saying, you should care less about short-term treasures that can flee and, you know, fly away and, and they're no longer yours. You can't keep them. And eternal treasures that you can't lose. I mean, so he's saying, don't, don't, don't turn away from treasures per se. I'm not, I'm not. Turn to the right treasures, the ones that matter, the ones that will last forever. So, so in the end, in some way, we could say this passage is not about money. See, Mark 10 is warning us about the power of money, but ultimately, he's not saying this is just money. It's about morality. It's about, it's about religiosity. It's about idolatry. It's about putting any other sun at the center of your orbit. It's about, I won't share you. I won't be a co-savior with anybody else. I won't do it. It's me and me alone, or it's not at all. And yet, it's all about money. I mean, this is a story about money. We can't just walk away and say, oh, oh, Chris said it's not about money. Woo! I can do whatever I want now. No, no, no. It was money that made this man, possessions that made this man walk away from Jesus. Money does that to people. What does money do to you? Ask yourself that question. What does it do to you? See, I I don't think it's an accident that for every time Jesus told us not to build our life on fame and power or whatever else it is or sex, he told us ten times, don't build it on money. Why? Why? Because he knows that there is probably no more powerful force in the universe that can hijack my heart and make me genuinely believe that it will save me. It'll save me. If I only had a few, I could do this. Right? I mean, look. (laughs) Because money, money's what gives you status. What you are wrapped in, the piece of metal that you're wrapped in as you drive around the, 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 on the highways says, I'm important. The neighborhood I live in, I'm important. I've got status. This means something. The clothes that I have on me, they got to be a certain brand. That means I'm, I'm important. I'm somebody. I got status. The friends that I run with, money buys me those things and I get them and that gives me identity. That's where I find my approval. That's where, I, that's where my spiritual center is. And if I lose this car, these clothes, that house, whatever, and all I've got is Jesus, are you kidding me? So 
I don't, I don't think I'm helping you. Those of you who want to wiggle off the hook and go, oh, good, it's not about money. Yes, it is. Um, so how do you know if money has that kind of grip on you? Let me just give you a couple things to think about. Jot these down. You can't give away large amounts. You can't do it. It's like, nope. I mean, it's just, it has too big of a grip on you. You you get scared if you have less than you're accustomed to. I might have to, I might have to downgrade my lifestyle. Oh no, I might have to buy a used Nissan and I can't own a Lexus. My identity just went out the door. Your scorecard is money and you have to win. This is how you know you're important in this world. Right? I mean, and what, what frustrates you beyond no end is that you're working hard and you're being religious, you're being moral, and you look over and there's a, a guy or a gal who's not being religious or moral or a good person at all, and they're making more money than you and not working near as hard. And your whole identity is like, wait a second. I should be winning. See, are those things true of you? Because look, if they are, then money has a grip on you like it has on this money. Man, so, so yes, it's all about money. And the question for you is if Jesus says, I want you to imagine, <laughs> can you walk away from that? Okay, so that's, that's the illustration. And now Jesus goes, guys, I want to apply this to you. I want you to see the truth that's underneath here. Okay, the man walks away, and Jesus again looks, and this time he sees his disciples, and they want to know, you know, kind of what's going on. So he looks at his disciples, and he kind of sees what's going on with them, and he says to them, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Now that's, that's is, think about that. Just step back for a second. What do you get amazed at? That's a weird thing to be amazed. He just said how difficult it would be for people with wealth to go, oh, would that make you do that? Um, why, why would they react like that? Because something that was so firmly embedded in their culture and in their theology was this, that money was not evil. In fact, money was good, and money was a reward for moral behavior. God was pleased. If God was pleased with you, you'd have material prosperity. If God wasn't pleased with you, you would be poor. So the rich were obviously blessed and God loved, and the poor were obviously hated by God or, you know, were, were being punished for something. This is the entire book of Job, by the way. Right, Job, Job, you know, his, his four friends come to him and say, Job, there's no, you, you, peep, this doesn't happen to people unless you've been wicked, unless you did something to displace God. And the whole point is that we got to be behind the scenes and see what's really happening, and we know it's not because of that. We know it's because God was doing something in Job. But this is the whole culture. And so, so, so when, they, when they say, how difficult is salvation? I mean, this is what Jesus is saying. How difficult will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? The answer to that question is, oh, guys, it's not difficult at all. It's impossible without God. Because look what he goes on. And the disciples were amazed, and he looks at them, and he says to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus ups the ante, and look what happens now. They are exceedingly astonished. Holy moly, what did you just say? Now, um, I don't know what you've heard about the camel and the eye of the needle, whole, that whole thing. There are some people that go, yeah, you know, when, if you go to Israel with us next year, they'll actually show you, they'll take you to a door, these big gates, they'll go, okay, right over here is this door that some people call, 
the eye of the needle. It's this little sort of, you know, alternate access route that you got to kind of get down and squeeze through. And, 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 and so if you took all the camel's baggage off and you gave them a real good shove and greased them up, you might get them through. So it's difficult. Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's nonsense. And here's why. That gate wasn't even put in until medieval times. This is not even in Jesus' mind. Jesus, look, he used hyperbole, right? He's not, we're not against, Jesus, Jesus said a, a couple of weeks ago, man, if your hand offends you, cut it off, your eye, gouge it out. Did he mean it? Did he mean really? Go do that? He, he was using this exaggeration. We, we do it in the English language, right? That doesn't have a snowball's chance in, right? What are we saying? You can't take a snowball to hell and expect that it's going to stay a snowball. It's impossible. So Jesus is going, I want you to imagine a needle and I want you to imagine a camel. Try to put the camel through the needle. They're like, <laughs> not possible. Right, that's it. Not possible. Impossible to put a camel through the eye of a needle. That's the point. He's saying, look, salvation isn't difficult. Salvation is is impossible. For who? He says for the wealthy, for the rich. Is that really true? Like if you drove here today in a BMW or a Mercedes, are you going to hell? You live in La Cunata, you got no chance. <laughs> no, well here, here's what I would say on the, on the one hand. Uh, we, we should not think of rich like that, first of all, because... Um, every person in this room is rich. You know, worldwide economists look at the economies around the world and they sort of create this GDP thing where they say, what's the buying power of, of individuals in different countries? The buying power in America is somewhere around $46,000 a year. I'm not saying you make that. Worldwide, your buying power is that. The buying power in most countries of the world is less than 10 you're ridiculously wealthy. And if Jesus means that rich people literally cannot go to heaven, then we're all dead because we're all very wealthy. Here's what I think he's saying. I think he's saying there's something so radically wrong with all of us that it is not possible to get to heaven to have eternal life under our own steam. And what, is, what do rich people, what do wealthy people like ourselves do? We got it all. We don't, we don't need anything, really. I'm not a needy person. I don't come as a child, like we saw a couple of weeks ago. We can't, I mean, this, do you notice the radical difference between what Jesus said last week? Let the children come, and now this man comes, and he's saying, you're not coming like a child. You're coming, you're coming like, I can do it. I got it. I'm, I'm, I'm self-sufficient. Got it all. Jesus says, you come like that, you'll never get in. There's something so radically wrong with us. We can't save ourselves. No amount of morality or religiosity is going to get me to heaven. It's impossible. And then he adds. But not with God. For all things are possible with God. What makes it possible? Not you. Not me. God and his grace. If God wants to save, he will save. It's possible with God. And to enter that kingdom, we need a miracle of God's grace. Okay, now, so now, here's what the disciples have just heard. They've heard this rich man who we thought was the epitome of blessing and God's hand upon him. You just said he can't go to heaven if he doesn't, you know, if, if he's going to just be relying on those things. And, and you just said that no amount of material things are ever going to help us get to heaven and, and giving up all these things, whatever. And so Peter looks, and here's the implication. Peter hears this and goes, wait a second. Look at, look at verse 28. He goes, Jesus. Okay, we, you've looked. Now, now, now you look at us. See, behold, we've left everything and followed you. You know what he's saying? He's going, okay, Jesus, I get it. If no, if no morality or no religiosity or no sacrifice can save us, then why should I sacrifice anything? That's what we've done. And that is a phenomenal question. I mean, what's the point? 
If all human effort always brings you up short of what God requires, then why try it all? And what in the world? How do sacrifices count for anything, Jesus? Are they ultimately worthless? And Jesus says, no. They're not ultimately worthless. His answer to that question is, guys, sacrifice won't earn your salvation, but it will earn rewards. Now, now look what he says. Verse 29, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Here's what he just said. So Jesus says, look, you're going to get a hundredfold return. Now that ought to kind of go, hmm, really? Because he said, truly I say to you, not falsely, I'm about to lie to you. <laughs> Is it true? Is it true? Does anybody in here own a hundred homes? I'd love to meet you. Anybody have a hundred dads or moms? See, see, some televangelists are going to read this passage and go, aha, yes, Jesus said it, right? I mean, they look at it and they go, here's the deal. Jesus just said, we have a right to be fabulously wealthy. God wants his children to be ridiculously rich. We just need to claim our inheritance in Jesus' name. I mean, this is a problem with all the generations before us. They failed to see this. And so now we're supposed to be crazy, crazy wealthy. Well, that's, that's nonsense because Jesus left everything and died a poor man and was nailed to a cross. Every disciple died most likely penniless and died horrific deaths. And if that is what it means that you and I are supposed to claim, if these televangelists are going to tell us that, man, this is ours, we get a hundred homes and we get a hundred, all these things, these things are come, supposed to come back to us a hundredfold, then I'd like to know when any of them fulfilled the prerequisites for getting this which is leave everything. Go be poor first. No, usually they're like, see my Rolls Royce out there? <laughs> God's blessing me. See, here's what Christ is saying. You will, in fact, if you're a believer in Jesus, this is true of you right now. Because when you came into the kingdom of God, you became part of a family of faith. And now you have hundreds, if not thousands, of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and people who freely share their possessions and their wealth and generously give to people who are in need. You see that? That's true. And to keep us from entering into some sort of utopia, he says, oh yeah, and with persecutions. That's been part of your lot right now. I remember when I was growing up in church, I remember hearing the older people in our, my, my grandma and grandpa would refer to people as brother and sister. Sometimes they'd refer to them as mom and pop. These were spiritual terms of endearment. Where'd they get that? They got it from here. That, that, that because they realized there was a greater affinity among the family of God than we just bump into each other on Sunday. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I don't really know your name. I don't care. I think we're missing something, truthfully. So it's all true. Okay, so let's, let's sort of bring this in for a landing. I told you, Matthew and Luke tell this story. And, and, and if we only read it in, in the book of Mark, we'd, we'd hear that he was a man. But, but Matthew and Luke fill in some details, and they tell us that he was young, and he was a ruler. I mean, just fabulously wealthy. So I, I think it's not a stretch to say this guy was probably in his early 30s. He had amassed a massive amount of wealth. He had been extraordinarily successful. But in the end, he would not and could not walk away from all that to pursue Jesus. He walked away from Jesus 
and pursued his wealth and said, this will save me. What I want you to see is how different, <laughs> how different he is from the real rich young ruler. Jesus is probably 31, 32. And the Bible says, Paul says it this way, he says, though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor so that by his poverty we might become rich. So where the rich young ruler of Mark 10, the man failed, our rich young ruler won and he gave away, he walked away from all of his fabulous wealth. He, he gave up more than we can imagine and asks us and simply says, you give up anything that competes for your allegiance to me. If that's money and possessions, walk away. If that's a person, walk away. Anything has to, has to come under, be subservient, be, be less than your worship of me. He gave up his father. He gave up his wealth. He gave us his kingdoms to come and rescue you and me so that you and I could follow him. And he's not asking you to do anything he hasn't already done himself. You see this? Now, if you understand that, that will change everything. That will transform your life. I'm not saying, oh, I, I get it. No, I, I see that, Chris. I'm saying, I, I'm not asking you to intellectually agree with that. I'm saying, if you really meditate and that becomes something that you know and becomes part of your fiber, it will transform you. It will suddenly make money and possessions lose their importance. Status will be nothing. Approval, irrelevant. None of those things will matter. What you'll be saying is, if there's any other God in there, I want to repent. I want to walk away from that God because the rich young ruler gave away everything to come and rescue me. And I am profoundly grateful and I will get on my knees and I will worship him. It'll change everything. Because he came for you. He came to rescue you. Are you willing to worship him and him alone? That is the cost of discipleship. Not Jesus plus. Jesus, plain and simple, alone. He's your savior. He's your God. And he left the riches of heaven to come after you so that in him, we could have that treasure that he talked about that'll never perish, never go away. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word does not leave us settled. It unsettles us all the time. And I, I pray, Lord, that as it does that in our hearts, the temptation is to grieve and to run away from that pain and say, I can't do that. I pray, God, give us the guts like you, Jesus, to grieve and go through with it. Knowing that like you, you endured the cross, you bore the shame for the joy set before you. There was a greater treasure you were after. And I pray, God, that we would see that joy and real treasure are being dangled out in front of us if we will stop worshiping our functional Savior and run to Jesus and see that you never disappoint. You never leave us alone. For some of us in this room, God, it is money and it is possessions. For some, it's a boyfriend or girlfriend or a husband or wife. For some, it's children. For some, it's a career. For some, God, it's, 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 it's the piece of metal that's wrapped around them as they drive down the, the highway. God, as, as pitiful as that is, God, help us. Save us, I pray. Save us, God, from from finding our status and identity in anything less than you. We can't save ourselves. Only you can. And so we cry out, God, give us mercy.
Give us grace and save us. In Jesus' name.